नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू इंडियन डिप्लोमेसी शो ऑन इंडिया नेशनल ब्रॉडकास्टर दूरदर्शन अबाउट इंडियन फॉरन पॉलिसी इंडिया इंटरनेशनल रिलेशन एंड इंडिया मेजर स्ट्रेटेजिक पार्टनरशिप्स अराउंड द वर्ल्ड व्यूअर्स इन दिस एपिसोड वी आर टेकिंग अप प्रॉबली द मोस्ट कॉन्सिक्वेंशियल स्ट्रेटेजिक पार्टनरशिप ऑफ इंडिया दैट इज विद द यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स ऑफ अमेरिका यू एस इंडिया रिलेशन्स आर ऑन एन अपस्विंग एंड द स्केल एंड द स्कोप ऑफ यू एस इंडिया comprehensive global strategic partnership that's what we are going to be discussing and uh, how far this is going and what kind of strategic impact it's going to have on our region and the world and to discuss this let me introduce you to a very special guest joining me from the united states an expert on uh, india us relations and uh, the us role in south asia dr samir lalwani dr lalwani is um, at the united states institute of peace uh, think tank in the us and uh, he uh, he also has taught at the george washington university he was previously at the stimson center another important think tank uh, and has as a specialization in crisis uh, and conflict situations in uh, south asia dr lalwani welcome to indian diplomacy thank you for having me on the show big fan dr lalwani so us india uh, the they are saying the they are, the both sides are saying that uh, now it spans uh, all human endeavors from the seas to the stars just the uh, massive scale of this relationship we have uh, seen prime minister narendra modi's successful visit to the united states uh, state visit and uh, just the elevation of the relationship to such a high level in so many dimensions we i don't think any relationship is as broad and as deep as us india and that's why i think justifiably the two sides are saying that they are the closest friends uh, in the whole world uh, short of an alliance but closest friends uh, and uh, strategic partners so i'd like you to start by reflecting on why you think it has reached this kind of pinnacle uh, in 2023 we've been working on this relationship for a long time and obviously there are cumulative gains and build up over the last two decades but uh, something seems to have changed uh, president biden was talking about an inflection point we are at an inflection point and that the us india is going to be the most decisive partnership so your opening thoughts on what is this inflection point why us india seem to be uh, rising to this crescendo well i think there are probably a couple reasons why we're seeing um not only sort of the rise of the relationship but an increased pace uh of the substance of the relationship So I think the first element is certainly learning, right? The the US and India have been at this for about 2 decades now and they've had some fits and starts, they've made some mistakes, um they've learned from each other's what are each other's priorities. And so we have the benefit of building on the past of previous efforts that may not have gone exactly as we, where we wanted mm. but are now um for providing fruit to this new relationship in terms of new initiatives. Uh the second though is clearly the motives, right? The motives have uh maybe sharpened over the last few years and that's clearly as a result of China. I think the Chinese aggression um in the Indo-Pacific uh on on India's borders on uh its relationships with other neighbors, its coercive behavior both economically, politically and militarily, um this has drawn a lot of attention uh by the United States force and India and I think out of mutual interest to counter this kind of coercion and pressure uh there's a natural drive to do more to work harder to uh work faster and uh to have more substance to the relationship so i think that motive is what's driving the political will to really uh push through some some things that were challenged in the past like a a ge jet engine deal but today uh there's enough political capital and a little political motivation to make these things happen uh yes dr lalwani so there is this big strategic convergence we've always had uh you know this uh, shared perception of china as a challenge and as a threat but uh, like you say it seems to have reached a certain tipping point or inflection point where i think uh, there is a greater sense of urgency isn't it both in washington and new delhi uh, that we must um, you know uh, join hands and join forces and uh, put up a united front and uh, that seems to be driving a lot of the relationship apart from so many other factors i mean this is so big that probably you know uh, a half an hour tv show cannot even explain the full range of the us india relationship but uh, the strategic convergence uh, both sides seems to have worked on them 
and the leadership factor um, uh, seems to have also mattered, uh, Dr. Lalwani. Uh, your thoughts, uh, there were a few jitters during the Trump administration about whether it will all work out and whether we will uh, uh, make progress. But now it seems to be like the back to the traditional type of uh, politics under uh, President Biden and they seem to be taking the India strategic partnership very, very seriously and want to take it to the next level. So uh, would you like to reflect, given that there's been this very, very high profile state visit of Prime Minister Modi with a lot of you know, public camaraderie and bonhomie with, uh, 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 and chemistry with President Biden, and he has done that with all previous um, occupants of the White House as well. Um, how do you think that has been driving, the top leadership uh, uh, has been driving this strategic convergence? Well, I certainly agree that uh, Prime Minister Modi has had good relationships across each of the previous uh, uh, presidential administrations, from the Obama administration to uh, President Trump to President Biden. Uh, and so maybe, um, you know, you, he has sort of both the magnetic personality and the showmanship, but also the substance and bureaucratic heft to drive forward uh, some of the, the changes that are needed in both our respective systems in the U.S. and India are famous for our democracies, but also for our bureaucracy. And mm -hmm. so overcoming the challenges and hurdles of those bureaucracies uh, is something that requires political leadership and political will. I think in the previous administration, you saw a lot of uh, showmanship. I mean, certainly President Trump was a great showman. He was uh, excellent at a, a public speech, uh, extemporaneous speaking, um, and sort of had that uh, personality relationship. But in terms of substance, I think there were some challenges within the Trump administration actually getting from an agreement or a deal to actual delivery. Uh, and I think where the Biden administration has really excelled is it's done its homework, right? They're uh, not just good speakers and um, uh, good deal makers, but they're good at getting their homework done, doing the, the due diligence within the bureaucracy, getting the regulatory approvals, uh, and sort of checking off all the boxes that are necessary to get something like um, a semiconductor, you know, major semiconductor investment in India or a, a jet engine deal investment or uh, uh, Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Initiative. And those uh, substantive efforts that are done through just the hard due diligence behind the scenes, mm. um, that's the stuff that I think is really starting to pay off now uh, in terms of the relationship. Yeah, so uh, a lot of the regulatory hurdles uh, have been removed and uh, continue to, both sides continue to work on uh, lessening the barriers uh, to all kinds, of, all kinds of exchange and cooperation. And we have seen that in the joint statement as well, uh, their commitment to uh, remove the hurdles and remove the obstacles. And that's uh, certainly something big. Uh, viewers, um, Prime Minister Narendra Modi in his historic um, address to the uh, US Congress uh, in June 2023 uh, made a very pointed reference to the geopolitical uh, strategic convers convergence that we have just been talking with Dr. Lalwani. Let's listen to the Indian Prime Minister's address uh, this excerpt and continue the discussion. The dark clouds of coercion and confrontation are casting their shadow in the Indo-Pacific. The stability of the region has become one of the central concerns of our partnership. We share a vision of a free, open, and inclusive Indo-Pacific. Connected by secure seas, defined by international law, free from domination, and anchored in ASEAN centrality. <laughs> A region where all nations, small and large, are free and fearless in their choices, where progress is not suffo suffocated by an impossible burdens of debt. <laughs> where connectivity is not leveraged for strategic purposes, 
where all nations are lifted by the high tide of shared prosperity. Our vision does not seek to content or exclude, but to build a cooperative region of peace and prosperity. We work through regional institutions and with our partners from within the region and beyond. Of this, core had emerged as a major force of good for the region. So viewers, um, Prime Minister of India addressing U.S. Congress and saying the Quad has emerged as a force for good. The, uh, President Biden also reinforced the same message saying that the Quad grouping that includes United States, India, Japan and Australia. Um, uh, President Biden said that the Quad, you know, in decades to come, people will say that it uh, bent the arc of history for global good. Um, so very high sentiments being expressed by the top leaders about uh, their shared approach to the Indo-Pacific and to the Quad. Coming back to you, um, Dr. Lalwani, um, you have been closely tracking and writing and advocating for enhanced cooperation uh, among Quad countries and especially between India and the US. And now, you know, they have announced a slew of new initiatives for military to military engagement and um, this uh, including, uh, for example, uh, repair of US naval ships uh, on, uh, along India's ports and um, also interoperability, more joint exercises, plus the defense uh, agreements, uh, the acquisitions and the joint co-production that you already mentioned. So um, I think this is really uh, core strategic, isn't it? When we say that uh, this is a comprehensive global strategic partnership, they are actually coming together to try and shape the region as a whole. I also observed uh, that the two sides announced uh, a, a plan for uh, digital public infrastructure uh, in the whole region uh, for digital public goods, which means the two sides, the scientific establishments will also come together to try and uh, build 5G and 6G networks and uh, uh, RAN and all these uh, uh, you know, advanced scientific telecommunication tools for the whole region. So your thoughts on how well this is going, how revolutionary are these new steps that have been announced, the new initiatives, and uh, will this help to stop the Chinese juggernaut? So I, you covered a lot of ground there and from science and technology to defense cooperation to digital public goods. So uh, look, I think in general, um, what we have now is a really substantive plan and a really clear architecture for how to go about executing that plan. Uh, and that's excellent. That's really important uh, stages of, of this process. But I do think we have to be diligent about following through and operationalizing all these elements, because I think sometimes we can become complacent. That is, we um, in the strategic community and policymakers can be complacent when we have an announcement for a plan and we have an architecture, but um, following through on sort of the details uh, sometimes gets left behind or gets sort of lost in, in the cracks. So in this case, I think what's really important is that we follow through on operationalizing all of these elements. It's great to have the quad. It's great that we coordinate and that we have um, pooling of resources and public goods. Uh, but I also want to see the quad have a deterrent effect. And for it to have a deterrent effect, we need to be routinely being able to operate with each other and not um, – not just having the potential to operate with each other, not just sort of having the foundational agreements in place, whether it's uh, for logistics or for intelligence sharing, but actually doing it day in and day out. Deterrence is a 365 uh, uh, day a year uh, activity. And that's something that I think we will be proven by simply doing it over the course of time. Uh, when it comes to uh, digital public infrastructure, I think that's another in incredible effort that's being led by India and the U.S. is support is, is backing India in this effort. This is uh, India's to lead, especially in the global south and in Africa, and it's direct competition with China's digital Silk Road. But again, this mm. is going to rest upon implementation, upon um, striking those deals with uh, the nations in the global south to accept DPI as a, that sort of this open architecture standard um, and that they can use for financial technologies, for um, uh, government services and distribution. Uh, and so that, that hard work of sort of uh, implementation is now the task for, for both our countries and for uh, institutions like the Quad. 
Absolutely. I mean, the proof of the pudding is in eating it. And uh, Dr. Lalwan is saying that we need to uh, see through all these uh, grandiose plans and ideas that we have expressed in the joint statement and the, by the two leaders. Uh, so a lot of groundwork will be ne uh, needed all across the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Dr. Lalwani, talk about the Chinese. I mean, we, uh, we have tracked the Chinese reactions to the um, latest uh, India-US uh, summit. And um, I've read uh, Wang Yi, the former foreign minister and now a senior official in the Chinese Communist Party, uh, publicly saying that, you know, the Americans are trying to use India uh, as a bulwark or as a puppet against uh, China and that, uh, you know, India must uh, not lose its strategic autonomy and uh, that India can never even dream of replacing China in the global supply chains. Americans will never really help the Indians beyond a point. So that skeptical view, I mean, sometimes you hear that even here uh, in, in Delhi, sometimes among some strategic elites who are still wary of the U.S., how would you respond to that? And uh, do you think we have finally left uh, these naysayers aside and are moving ahead with total confidence in the relationship India-US? Or are there still, you would say, some hesitation? I mean, Prime Minister uh, Modi was saying we have overcome the hesitation of history. But uh, is that so? And are the systems on both sides really ready for this uh, to, to, uh, to basically neutralize the Chinese hopes that they can still keep India and the United States divided? Well, I think the the very fact that Wang Yi is is writing this uh, and and trying to assert that the India-U.S. relationship is not as strong as it is uh, is testament to the fact that the relationship is working. Right? It's it's creating some doubt, some uncertainty, some concern in Beijing, and maybe that's uh, sort of a, an important first step in, in the relationship is to to seed some of that doubt, not not for just dis, uh, disruptive purposes, but really so that China hesitates when it tries to. Uh, aggress against um, another nation or tries to bully other nations um, politically and economically. So I think that's important. Uh, in terms of the uh, sort of India's autonomy, I mean, you're, you raise a good point. I do hear naysayers and doubters uh, in New Delhi uh, sometimes raising their voices that there's there's reason to be concerned. And I think again, you have to trust the Indian government and its leadership. They've made they've exercised their autonomy by choosing to collaborate with the United States by choosing to collaborate with the Quad. And the U.S. and the Quad are not uh, making this a uh, mutually exclusive proposition. India can still be the, the chairperson of the CE, of the SEO, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, it can still be an active member in BRICS uh, and lead the G20. Um, those are, uh, India's sort of multi-alignment is mm -hmm. not a threat to, I think, the U.S. and to the Quad membership. I think what, what the, the, those uh, partners and those institutions care about is doing the things that we say that we're going to do, pooling those resources, whether it's intelligence or financing for development and infrastructure or um, distributing public goods like vaccines or uh, open RAN uh, 5G networks uh, or doing the things that, that matter for security like uh, intelligence coordination and maritime domain awareness um, and uh, making sure that the, the these are open and the, there's freedom of navigation and overflight. So uh, those things to me are not mutually exclusive with India's desire to be multi-aligned. I think, you know, for the last year plus, there's been a debate within Washington about India's relationship with Russia. And mm. I think the truth is that the administration and the U.S. government has come to terms with the fact that India is going to have a maintain a strong relationship with Russia for reasons that have to do with history, that have to do with uh, supply chains and, and arms dependencies. Um, and just a belief that India, India has sort of a different worldview uh, with some regards when it comes to Russia. I think the United States can live with that. We're both strong enough countries to sort of accept that we have other friends. Uh, yes. But I think there the distinction is that um, if we're working together on a collaborative purpose for, for balancing power in Asia, uh, for checking aggression and hegemony and coercion um, in the Indo-Pacific, then I think we can uh, sublimate some of those other, other concerns. We can live uh, with some differences. We can agree to disagree. In fact, uh, friends uh, and strategic partners often have disagreements, uh, but that doesn't uh, deter the broader uh, convergence. Um, viewers, uh, the point is um, now it's not only geopolitical and defense. Uh, there's one more leg to the U.S.-India partnership, which is actually the most central and which is taking us 
uh, to, to, to the next level and this is the economic partnership which of course is linked to national security as well. I would like you to hear some top CEOs of American companies um, who met Prime Minister Modi and uh, are committing to invest in um, critical and emerging technologies uh, in India to build up India's capacities. Let us hear these American honchos and continue the discussion. India is a trusted partner, so I think whether it's applied materials or many companies around the world, they see the trust and also the tremendous talent that is there in India. And I just deeply believe this is India's time to shine. We will be announcing soon a new innovation center in India uh, with applied materials. We'll also bring global partners into this new innovation center. And this innovation center will really be focused on innovation in the equipment. And we have uh, very high confidence that working together with India, we can create a tremendous success. Mitron is a global leader in memory and storage. And we are a supplier to, um, for memory and storage in all end markets from data centers, to uh, smartphones, to PCs, and today really fueling the AI engine as well. So we are excited about the opportunities that exist for the future of memory and storage. And again, congratulations to Prime Minister Modi on his excellent visit. I think there's, there's a tremendous amount of uh, potential uh, for all three pillars of the um, sustainable energy future. Uh, the, th the three pillars being uh, sustainable energy generation through solar and wind primarily. And obviously India is great for solar. Um, and um, the amount of land area you actually need to generate enough uh, electricity to power India is, is very small. I, I believe it would be probably le 1 or 2 percent of the land area of India. So it's, it's very doable. Um, and then you need to pair that with uh, stationary battery packs uh, because the sun doesn't shine at night. And then you need electric vehicles. And then you have a sustainable energy future. And I think it will, uh, uh, the, the interesting thing people will find is that this is a lower cost way to go as well. Right, viewers, so um, CEOs and um, top leaders of uh, major American companies, uh, Applied Materials, uh, Tesla, Micron, they're all talking about uh, the prospects of investing in India, uh, skilling workforce in India, jointly co-developing advanced state-of-the-art technologies in India. Uh, this is, uh, Dr. Lalwani, coming back to you, I mean, this is, this seems like um, the most important, uh, you know, we are on the anvil of something big, right? I mean, al always there have been investments from the U.S. into India for Make in India, and over the last 10 years we have seen uh, upward uh, trajectory. But the kind of strategic projects we are talking about, you know, under the ICET, for example, uh, which has got national security implications as well, apart from business proposition, these uh, looks like the confidence of corporate America. Uh, in India has risen many fold uh, lately, especially in, since the post COVID recovery. Your thoughts on the economic relationship and uh, these cutting edge fields, which seem to be taking this relationship to, you know, a stratospheric level. Yeah, I, I think that, um, again, here we have uh, in part China to thank for uh, some of this diversification and, and sort of some of the efforts by U.S. industry and investment to friendshore. Um, to a place like India. Uh, part of this has been China's like exploitative behavior when it comes to investments in its country, uh, in, in foreign direct investment, appropriating technologies, stealing technologies, uh, changing the terms of trade and, um, and, and sort of regulation. So a lot of companies have been burned in China over the last two decades. Uh, even though those money to be made, uh, there was technological theft and exploitation, uh, and they're, they're pretty frustrated. So they're looking for other places. And India is an ideal space for uh, significant manufacturing investment and high technology investment. Uh, but again, uh, this will depend on a number of things that India does. I think there's, this is a moment of opportunity, but one that again has to be seized with uh, just the, the daily hard work of, of as, you, as you mentioned, skilling, right? This is gonna be something, this is not simply about uh, sort of the most elite high tech uh, programmers and, and um, you know, computational engineers this is about uh, skilling sort of at, at, you know, in factories and sort of for manufacturing and advanced manufacturing. Um, this is going to be about regulatory predictability 
I think something that has been a concern uh, in recent years is essentially the rules being changed uh, for companies that come in and invest. Certainly, this has been the case um, with you know countries uh, co- companies like Amazon and and Walmart that have uh, made significant investments and then found that uh, the regulatory environment was shifting under their feet, and that can be uh, uh, that's a risk that you know India uh, should be careful of. And then I think the third area is uh, just about openness of market, right? And so, so in, in some ways, making India is a great idea because the objective is to build in India, to innovate in India, uh, to essentially, you know, build the economy uh, through sort of the, the size of India's market power. Uh, but at the same time, going too far in that, where it's pure import substitution, will really limit the ability for India mm. to... Uh, capitalize on these investments. If you have to sort of source everything domestically when there are more competitive, um, you know, prices elsewhere, uh, where your your big conglomerates are protected from competition and they can't actually be can compete uh, on the international stage. Uh, so I think this is the kind of this is an experience that you know the the East Asian uh, NICs had to learn uh, from Korea to Hong Kong to Singapore uh, and Taiwan uh, back in the 1990s. And I think it's something that um, that India will will have to. Uh, take on as well, but I think all the all the pieces are in place. It's just a matter of implementation uh, and policy framework to to ensure that um, that these these investments pay off. Right. Uh, so viewers, uh, Dr. Sami Lalwani is saying that all the pieces are in place. Uh, the trust is there, and today when it comes to technology, there's a clear division of the world. There is the you know sino centric sphere where they are developing their own networks of technology. And then there is the Western one centered around the U.S. And uh, India is definitely aligning, as Dr. Lalwani says, um, building indigenous capacities, of course, is India's ultimate goal. But uh, we can't wait 15, 20 years for some uh, critical areas. Uh, so therefore, uh, cooperating and collaborating with the U.S. is going to be very critical. The trusted technology partner, trusted networks is the buzzword in both uh, New York and uh, in both uh, Washington and uh, in uh, New Delhi, and I think uh, that's the way forward. Uh, so unprecedented levels of cooperation are happening, and I think U.S.-India partnership um, has a bright future. There's just no question about it. The question uh, really, as Dr. Lalwani uh, has mentioned, is of implementation, and uh, we should uh, see through a lot of these uh, promising new endeavors and initiatives. I want to thank Dr. Samil Lalwani for sharing uh, wonderful insights and uh, for being a champion for India-U.S. cooperation. Thank you for your work. Thank you again. I really appreciate it. So viewers, uh, India-U.S. cooperation uh, has entered a new era. Uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has said that there's a new energy and a new direction to our comprehensive strategic global partnership. Let's keep an eye on this because this is, uh, it's not an exaggeration. This is a defining partnership for the shaping the international order to come. I'll see you again next time. Until then, take care.